so my name is uh, Glenn Garcia, uh, born and raised in Denver, Colorado. Uh, Want to just shout out the team at Overcome Media for letting me, uh, for inviting me to share this testimony of the things that the Lord has done in my life. And to really get to the heart of what the Lord has done, I want to just share very quickly about where I come from, where what I've come out of. You know, for me, one of the issues that I had throughout my whole life, and, and you see it with regard to the habits I formed, the people I was around, the things I did, the choices I made, is I always felt like I was missing something in my life. Uh, I, I'm not a tall guy, so I guess, you know, sometimes I felt like maybe I was being overlooked. I would need attention, but I always felt like there was a need for more nothing ever really satisfied me. Um, as a kid, you know, I always wanted something better, wanted a, a better bike, wanted better this, wanted more of that. And I would often have my eyes on the things that other people had or the lives that other people lived, whether they were, you know, um, people that I lived around or people that I knew or even people that I, things and situations I seen on TV or whatever the case may be. But that was always a major factor for me. And so it got to the point where as I got to be 13 and 14 and 15 years old, I started to turn to things that weren't just unhealthy for me, but things that were downright dangerous. You know, um, growing up, I, I, I had some understanding of the church and of who Jesus was and having a relationship with him, but I never took being discipled seriously. So like I say, by the time I'm 13 years old, 14 years old, 15 years old, um, I'm just backing out of the church. And then completely by the time I'm 15 years old, you can't get me into the church or even involved with the things of God. And so at that point in my life, I started to go deeper into drinking. I, alcohol was a thing for me even before that. But again, nothing ever satisfied me. Nothing was ever enough. So there's the alcohol. And with the alcohol, it would take me around certain groups and certain people and, and certain situations where now it's alcohol and violence and now it's alcohol and drugs and violence and these different things I was always doing. Because remember, my problem was I always felt like something was missing. And so that really dictated my life. Like I say, alcohol, still something's missing. You know, the violence and the fights and the various things that would go on in the neighborhood. Um, there was a part of that that I, I kind of liked, but still something was missing. The drugs and, you know, first, of course, it starts with weed for us and then we're doing these other things. And But even as I take in all of those, something is missing. And one of the things about that habit and that, uh, that, that always that having that in my life and in my heart was the fact that, so I would drink more than a lot of people. I would act out more than a lot of people. I would, when it came to drugs, I would use drugs more in, in a, in a more, uh, intense way than a lot of people. And really, you know, we would call that having an addictive personality, but the truth is it came from this. I was never satisfied and something was always missing. And so, like I said, I get to that point where I'm about 15 years old. I'm, I'm in high school. I'm beginning to run around with a bunch of other people. You know, we're, um, getting involved in, like I say, violence and partying. There's some gang involvement in my life at that point. And that just continues on throughout my high school years. I, even to the point where I didn't end up graduating high school. Because again, like I say, there was always something missing. And one of the things that really started to mess me up is I knew, that my life was meant for more. And again, back to that, there's always something missing. I knew my life was meant for more, but again, I didn't graduate high school. I had wasted those four years of my life. I didn't have any potential to go to college or to do anything else with my life. So still having that, that void in my heart, something's missing. So I start partying harder. I start doing things. And even at that, some of the things that I did, um, <clears throat> again, going back to this addictive personality, getting involved with drugs, um, using drugs, with selling drugs, making a few bucks off of drugs. And with that, entered into business. But even as I accomplished a couple of things in business, it never became what it should have been because it was always corrupted because of these addictive personalities, because my priorities weren't right, because I didn't know um, how things should be done. I should have, right? I should have been in school. I should have been learning. I should have been working hard. But instead, I had, at, by this time in my 20s, I learned how to party hard. I learned how to hustle hard. I'd learned how to do all these things. And like I say, doing them more than most people would. 
And so that takes up all of my third, all of my twenties rather. And then into my thirties, man, in my thirties, people that I know that I went to school with, people that I grew up with, some of them are living the same life as I am. And they're just as messed up or more messed up than me. I can't even really say they're more messed up, just different situations. But then they're start, I'm starting to see people in my life who are, who are, uh, starting to thrive and, 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 and make these big purchases, even purchasing their second home and all this other stuff. And so I'm seeing these things with people that are my ages. Like I say, as, as I approach my thirties and, and get into my thirties, um, I really start to get this sense that I've wasted my life. But one thing I could never shake was that I was built for more and something was always missing. And so with that, I always pursued the next new thing I was. And, and some would say, you know, that's part of an entrepreneurial spirit maybe that is within me. And I, I guess I can agree with that. <clears throat> but all these things come and get me to the point in my life where in my mid-30s, I end up... Um, I, I'd call By then, I'm a felon. I've caught multiple cases for this or that. The blessing is I had never done state time at that point. But by the time I hit my mid-30s, I get in trouble. The drinking, the drugs, um, all of it has me out late one night. I get caught. And this time, I'm not going to do what I did every other time. I'm not going to spend the money trying to fight and spend the money bonding out and this and that. I just was resigned to the fact that, you know, my life as I know it is over. Still couldn't shake the feeling that something was missing, that I was made for more. But I pretty much had counted the fact that I had wasted my life. I, I just counted that to be my reality. And so I'm in uh, Jefferson County Jail here in, in, in Colorado. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm in Jefferson County Jail here in Colorado. And as I'm in this jail... Again, just realizing my life is over, that I haven't done what I was built to do, what I was meant to do with my life. Um, I get I, I get some information that there's a men's rehab home, a Christian men's rehab home. Now, in my 20s and even in my early 30s, I had been invited to be a part of these Christian men's rehab homes, um, discipleship homes from the various ministries and stuff. People would always tell me about them, tell me I needed to be there, but I wasn't trying to look for that. But this time was something different, and I just felt like... You know, maybe I can go there. Maybe I can. Uh, my life's over anyway. It doesn't matter. So my mid-30s, I end up in the men's home at New Hope Ministries of Lakewood, um, where Pastor Ray Chavez is a senior pastor. Pastor Ed Espinosa is uh, over the men's home. Uh, Jared Gallegos was, my, was the director of the men's home. So I end up there. And again, as I start to sober up for an extended period of time, as I really have to deal with myself... Again, this stirring feeling that there's more for me and that I don't have everything that I should have comes into my heart. But this time, it's something different because this time there's a hope behind it. This time I'm being, I'm in this men's rehab home and I'm learning, learning how to pray for two and three and five and six hours a day. I'm learning what it is to study God and his word you know, three and four and five times a day. I'm in multiple church services a week. And all of a sudden, after a couple of weeks of, like I say, the sobriety, but then also pressing in and being discipled, all of a sudden I have this encounter with God. And I'm going to talk about this briefly because this is truly the part of my testimony that matters the most is that I had this encounter with God. Because for all of these other years, something is missing. But as I began to encounter God, the living God, as I began to encounter Jesus who paid the price for my sin and understand, yes, I was always missing something, but understanding also I could be fulfilled in Him. I could be filled with His Spirit and my life could be fulfilled in Christ. Um, so if, I think I'm, a, I'm, I'm maybe a four to six weeks in this home and I have this encounter and it just every time I close my eyes I can sense the presence of God and how close he is every time I would lift my eyes I would know that I was looking to heaven where 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 the Lord was every time I would bow my head I was no I would know that I was giving reverence to to the God that that 
saved me and that was encountering me and was touching me. Every time I'd open the Bible to read, I would I would see the words just jump off the page and read to me. Every time I would speak a word in prayer, I would know that I was in the presence of one that was listening to me. And all of a sudden, my need for more I can feel it being fulfilled. I can feel that part of my heart um, being being uh, being filled up, and it just it amazed me because after all these years in this time, there was addiction, there was perversion. Um, there's all this, all these things. I hurt my wife. I hurt, was hurting my children. I was I was uh, uh, I was a pain in the neck to my community, to my family, like all these stories. Here's the thing. Uh, you could, if you know someone that knows me, they'll tell you any number of stories about me. And some people would say, well, I should give that part of my testimony. But the true part of my testimony is that in this men's home, it, it was, it was difficult because like I say, I don't know if you get it. We're praying three and four and five hours a day. That's not easy. We're reading the Bible and studying the Bible and doing lessons Two and three and four times a day, we're in church service regularly every week. And, and, and that's not necessarily easy. But it took that to, to break that part of my heart. And, it, and it, it, it really, it just began to change me. So back to this encounter that I'm having with the Lord. And I would say, I would kind of guess that it lasted about three weeks, this encounter. But in that time, I began to be filled more and more with the presence, with the spirit, with the power of God. And even with the most importantly, even with the love of God. For one, knowing that he loves me. And then as I receive his love, being able to give that love out. And something you got to know, and I think this is important for me to mention in this testimony is, again, I had some people in the church early in my life. So I knew the local community church leaders. I knew men and women of God. They were in my life. I had an auntie that was crazy for Jesus, I have a preacher in the community that was crazy for Jesus. But here's one of the problems that kept me away for so long is that I was so rude and belligerent. I was a jerk to people of God that were living right, including my own mother. She was living right for the Lord, and I was a jerk to her over her relationship with the Lord. So that was one thing that kept me away, was that from the things of God, from the kingdom of God, because I just thought I had done too much. I thought I had hurt people that really loved God and lived for God in a right way, so God could never forgive me or love me. But when I encountered God, when I really surrendered and just said, Lord, if you'll receive me, just just have your way with me. And when I let him have his way, that's when that encounter started. And it really became this personal encounter. Like I say, it lasted about the intensity of this one personal encounter lasted about three weeks. And, and I don't know if there's people out there that have had similar experiences, but it was in that moment that years and years and years of of trauma and and nonsense and addiction and habits and strongholds and 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 wrong mindsets and 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 um all of that just just being torn down and even in that like i say this this period of about 3 weeks where i'm encountering the lord i also got strength to push through the trials and the years that would be ahead of me and also that discipline to continue to seek the Lord, to continue to go after God and and um, be a man of the word and be a man of integrity and, and, and walk as he's called us to. And so I have this encounter. This is in about, this is in 2011. I have this encounter with the Lord. It lasts like three weeks. And there's just so many amazing things that had gone on in it. There were times I would open the Bible. The Bible was just basically reading me and reading to me. But let me say this. I want to, part of this testimony is that for weeks before that, I would read and I didn't feel anything. But I kept on reading. I would pray and I would wonder, am I being heard? But I kept on praying. And one thing I discovered about God in that season and in that encounter is that he's always faithful. I feel like that encounter was maybe the most impactful thing to happen to me in my life at this, even till now, that was 13, 14 years ago, even till now, um, the most impactful thing to happen in my life because it just showed me and testified about the faithfulness of God in my life. And even 
that it wasn't just for me, it's for everyone out there. And then, of course, uh, that was in 2011. Um, later on that year, my my girlfriend, me and Joey, uh, had been together 17, 18 years. We get married. 17 years, we get married. Um, she's now my wife. We've been together 30 years. Uh, been married for 13 years, I guess is the math. My daughter, my son, um, saved. My, my oldest daughter at that point, the relationship is very tense and intense. And, you know, it took some time of... of working on that and, and, and just being a vessel to minister to her. And, um, ultimately, you know, just becoming the man that I should have been all those years in her life. And, and even that there were some things that were not easy and things that maybe didn't work out perfectly from my perspective. But I also know that again, learning about the faithfulness of God, that in all things, his word says he's working for the good of those that love him and are called according to his purpose. See, because one of the things about God's faithfulness is it's about his purpose. He's faithful to his word. He's not faithful to just me. He's faithful to draw me into that place that he had for me. He's faithful to draw me into the purpose that he designed me for. And to somebody out there, I want to tell you, he's faithful to draw you into that place that he has for you, into that purpose that he has for you. And it's not always going to come easy. But I think about how hard my life was before that. I hustled hard. I burned people hard. I um, like I partied hard. All those things, right? And I struggled hard. I suffered hard. I mean, there's going to be difficulty in our life no matter what. But it's up to you. It's up to me. What is your difficult going to be? You're going to go through the difficult, the struggle, the trial, seeking the Lord. And so um, I learned how to do that in that men's discipleship home. And, and in that, we um, I had spent a year and a half in that home until ultimately I was blessed out in 2012, it was. And then uh, from there, just continued serving the Lord, continued in ministry. Um, as I got blessed out of the home, I, again, I'm a married man that had just spent a year and a half in the home, but um, had to learn how to be a husband. But again, seeing God be faithful and learning to be just like that, the faithfulness of God. It's one of the fruits of God's Holy Spirit is uh, faithfulness. And so, you know, um, growing in being a husband, um, growing in being a father, growing in being a leader in the community to the point where we are now today, as I give this testimony, um, I have the privilege of serving the Lord by leading a local church, New Hope Ministries of Central Denver. It, it, but through all of that, those are good things. I, I, well, a lot of people will call me Pastor Glenn now. You know, that's a blessing. That's a privilege. But the greatest thing God has done and Jesus did was not make me a pastor. The greatest thing he did was he made me a son. And there's times where I read the word of God and as a son, I receive the fact that I've got to be content with everything that I have. And then there's times in seasons where as a son, I know that one of the reasons it's hard for me to be content is because he has more for me. But again, he's working all things for the good when I'm, when I'm walking according to his purpose, when I'm doing the things he's called me to. And I want to tell somebody out there, you know what? You may think maybe your situation's not perfect. Maybe it's terrible. Listen, those are the things that God works in. Trust me, so many, I, I can't tell you how many times hung over, how many times in jail, how many times, how many cars I totaled, how many, uh, how many cars I just wrecked regular, how many times I've broken my door, how many times I've broken my windows in my own house, my own property. I've terrified my own children. All of those things have happened in my life, but I'm here today to testify that God is faithful and the blessing for me came and it's, it'll be the same blessing for you was when I surrendered and let him have his way. And again, like I say to this day, um, just continue to serve the Lord. I'm not perfect um, to a lot of people. My life would not look perfect, but I'll tell you what, it also is an amazing life suffered some hard losses, but in that I've climbed and, and, and conquered some things that I never would have been able to apart from the Lord. 
And so I just want to tell you today that no matter what you are going through or even what you have gone through, if there is breath in your lungs, he's not done with us. He is faithful. And even as I share a little bit about that tremendous testimony, here's the thing. We should be pursuing God with an expectation that he's going to, ma he's going to meet us and he's going to exceed even our efforts to seek him. And it's important that you understand not to seek him for what he's about to do, but to seek him for who he is. Because each and every one of us that at the sound of my voice, you need that him as heavenly father in your life. And as I learned that, that's the greatest thing he's done. Because even if I ever stop being Pastor Glenn or, or the church or things, things that I have were to go away, I know I am still a son. And that has been the greatest thing for me. And, uh, you know, I, I pray that this makes some sense and this ministers to you and speaks to you. Um, again, as, as I talk, it's just been uh, amazing what God has done. But I came, I dug a pretty deep hole from to the depths. And I've watched the Lord and I've been a part of what the Lord has done to, to bring me out. And I'm just grateful for that. anything you'd like to share with somebody right now who's struggling to surrender and what would, what would you say would be the first thing that they do to, to give their heart to Jesus you know what the first thing is shutting everything off Jesus said when you go into your secret place you close the door and you know what stop listening to everybody and everything else even your own thoughts you know what cry out to him the one that died for you, his name is Jesus. Cry out to him and ask him. Keep crying. Keep seeking him. You know what? The only thing I would encourage you is open up your Bible and cry out to him. Put everything else aside. Those things, those voices, those temptations, you know what? They'll be there, but you need the Lord. And that was one of the things that the men's home did for me was it gave me an opportunity to put just everything else aside. Even, like I say, I had that entrepreneurial spirit and always thought I wanted more. Um, that's where I was trained to really put things aside and receive what God has for me. And even um, he, what he has for you, that's, that's what's so important for you is what he has, what he has for you. Put everything else aside. Cry out to him. And know he is faithful to answer. He's speaking to some of you right now. Amen, Pastor. Thank you for your testimony. Amen. I want to thank Overcome Media. They're, um, you know, we're just praying great things for, for you, for the team. And grateful for this opportunity. And for those of you out there, um, again, just want to encourage you. You know what? Just shut everything out. Focus on him. It may be an hour. It may be a season but also expect to hear from him. He's faithful.